this issue about regulation keeps coming up, particularly regulatory reporting and big data analytics. Uh, and it's not surprising that this is a very important conversation. We move now to the final session for today's Europe, Middle East and Africa zone. Uh, international use cases shows it is possible to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of data collection by standardizing data representations and changing the architecture and the governance of reporting. So the next panel explores ways in which regulators and the private sector can move towards new regulatory reporting and analytics platforms. Moderating the panel will be Dr. Joy Wan, who is advisor to uh, the Bank for International Settlements. And joining her on the panel will be Dr. Maciej Piaski, who is a RegTech Management Board member of Bearing Point RegTech. Ian Sloyan, who is Director of Market Infrastructure and Technology at the International Swaps and Derivatives Association. And Kenneth Gay, Executive Director for Enterprise Knowledge Department at the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Well, good afternoon and good evening, or a very early good morning to you all. Um, it's a, a great pleasure and privilege to be able to participate in this year's um, Singapore FinTech Festival. And many thanks to the festival organizers and the MAS for inviting us to speak today. My name is Joy Wan. I'm an advisor at the Bank for International Settlements Innovation Hub Centre here in Singapore. And I'm absolutely delighted to be moderating today's panel on the topic of regulatory reporting um, and big data analytics. Specifically addressing a question I think that many authorities and, and financial institutions around the world are considering, which is how do we move from static reports to, to real-time monitoring? I'm really delighted to be joined on this panel by three eminent speakers who are leading prominent initiatives in this area and who are very well placed to help answer this question. It's my pleasure to introduce um, uh, Machie from uh, Reg, uh, Reg, Bearing Point RegTech, Ian Sloyan, uh, from ISDA and Kenneth Gay from the Monetary Authority of Singapore. Well, to kick things off, let's start with regulatory reporting. I think we can all agree that the global pandemic has certainly highlighted that at times of heightened risk, the need for up-to-date or real-time data increases. But I think it's safe to say that the majority of um, supervisory authorities around the world, this is probably not being possible under current regulatory uh, reporting and, and data collection frameworks. Um, common pain points that we hear a lot from authorities around the world are that regulatory reporting is still highly manual, it's infrequent, um, it's required at fixed time intervals, mostly uh, quarterly or, or semi-annually, it's template-based um, and hence uh, inflexible. Um, for more broader and local use, that is. And it's also quite burdensome uh, for reporting entities as new re um, regulations will lead to, to ad hoc data requests. So the question, therefore, to the speakers, how can we improve the efficiency and effectiveness of regulatory reporting, um, both for authorities and for reporting entities? I mean, is this simply a matter of um, adopting new technology solutions to help with streamlining and automating processes, or is this more about making the data more effective and efficient? So perhaps, um, Ian and Maciej, if I can first turn to you for your views on this. I mean, do we need to fix the data, uh, the architecture, or both? Thank you, Joy. I, I, I'll start off and say that I think, yes, both need to be addressed. Um, however, uh, speaking from our own position at ISDA, I think standards are key um, in order to be able to do that. Um, a lot of good work is being done um, to standardize and harmonize the, the data requirements ac across the globe by global regulators. Um, but the implementation layer where people have to implement the regulations uh, hasn't been harmonized and, and efforts such as uh, our own ISDA CDM and applying it to regulatory reporting uh, uh, initiatives such as this, we believe, are, 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 are key to, to um, improving things and basically helping people uh, with, the, with the implementation and um, compliance with rules. 
Let me just maybe add to it and then Joy, I think maybe the first reaction on your statement, what we've experienced with COVID, uh, while most regulators would need more data, they found themselves in the situation that instead of that, they needed to relax some data reporting rules to unbar them the firms, which is a bit of the paradox, which we are saying that the current system is not optimal. I fully uh, agree with Ian, we need data standardization. So I think there's absolute backbone that we need ideally the standardization on the contract and or transaction level. But I would like to add to it that we also need to work on the infrastructure. So the, even if you have standard in place, we are today in a very much push oriented infrastructures, meaning that the banks, insurers are pushing data to regulators, which removes the flexibility. And actually we have to change this in a, in a kind of paradigm shift to a more, more pool oriented approach. And this is where you need to combine the data standardization, absolutely right point, with the infrastructure that will allow for such a pool. Absolutely, I fully agree. Perhaps, Ken, if I can bring you in now um, to provide um, this is the viewpoint from, from the authorities. I mean, how do you, um, what, what are your views on this? Is it simply a matter of trying to standardise the data first, um, or, or is the MAS, for instance, looking as well at um, upgrading the technology solutions around this? Thanks, Joy. And... Uh... First of all, uh, good morning, afternoon and evening to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with all of you. Uh, just as a quick introduction before I share a little bit about myself, before I share a little bit further about the, uh, to answer Joy's question. Um, my name is Kenneth Kay and uh, I head up a newly formed uh, department at the Monetary Authority called the Enterprise Knowledge Department uh, that uh, helps to bring together structured and unstructured uh, data across the organization. Uh, I also have another role of uh, leading the Prudential Policy Department uh, at the authority. And uh, to answer Joy's question, I was actually in that role that uh, we had to actually uh, bring together a lot of COVID-related data because we were designing policies in order to you know, help uh, individuals and businesses arising from the pandemic. And to answer your question as to how we went about doing it, I would say that having the lens of data in terms of you know, whether it's standards or architecture are all very useful, are well and good you know, in terms of theory, but not as useful when there's a crunch in front of us where there's actually a problem to solve. So what I would say is that the pandemic has actually exposed, uh, if you will, uh, the, the comparative lack of, uh, if you will, uh, data uh, maturity, I think both on the uh, regulators end as well as those of the regulator entity. Uh, ideally, we would want a situation, for example, like what uh, Machich pointed out, that uh, one could just pull, you know, the relevant data fields uh, from the financial institution. Uh, but in this case, a lot of the data doesn't even exist right now because prior to the current uh, crisis, uh, a lot of, uh, we, we would not have situations of having uh, moratoriums on loans, for example, uh, as, and, 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 and those, uh, you know, and, and other details as well, more granular details on the borrowers that we would need in order to gauge which segments are more at risk. So in truth, what really happened during the crisis was that we really had to uh, make do with whatever we could in terms of the data. And we focused a lot on the use case, which is something that I will come back to later. The use case to us is very important. Uh, we had an issue that we needed to solve, right? There is a crisis upon us and we needed to see what combination of policies would be able to best help, you know, the affected, uh, uh, you know, individuals and businesses in Singapore. With the data that we collected, uh, we were able to quite quickly uh, come up with a set of policies uh, in order to help them. Uh, and subsequently, with even more data on hand, we were able to uh, calibrate these policies and in a way taper them as well in a, in a, in a sensible manner. And all this is only possible uh, with the data that you collect uh, from the uh, institutions in as quick a time as possible. But I would have to say, you know, uh, not, not, not exactly to the, uh, uh, you know, to the, to the best of uh, uh, if you were data standards and architecture at the start. But you did have a subsequent question, Joy, which I also now try to address. How do we then think about it moving forward? And that is something that I think is quite an uh, interesting area. Definitely, uh, the authority would like to explore, you know, more effective ways of uh, collecting data. And I think uh, the other panelists have already, uh, you know, raised some of these examples, whether it is uh, data pool, or coming up, of course, with uh, you know uh, a, a proper data model and then building off of that.
but uh, happy to discuss this further during the course of our panel. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. No, very, very important insights. I mean, data standardization, of course, is, is the golden uh, destination that we're heading to. But perhaps if I can ask um, Ian, um, the CDM that you mentioned is perhaps the closest use case. Um, I don't know if it's in production yet, but uh, certainly the closest use case that has gone down this path of developing a data model. Can you tell us a little bit more about how ISDA um, went about developing this in, in conjunction with um, uh, financial institutions, for instance? Yeah, so um, what we've said about doing is, is developing a, a data model for the life cycle of transactions. Um, focused, uh, we are the International Swaps and Derivatives Association, so focused on derivatives initially, but we've been joined recently by ISLA and ICMA to look at uh, securities lending and repo transactions. Um, but we, we aim to model the lifecycle event and aim to model the data as it's used in, in people's systems for settlement and for, for risk analysis and, and what they use um, day to day in their, in their systems. And then from there, we can um, project from it to, to regulatory reports and, and, and basically allow the regulators see the, the data in the form they require it. Um, so the, the use case of reporting is one we've, we've explored and indeed we were successful in the G20 tax print recently and we're also involved in the Hack Accelerator as part of the, the, the Singapore FinTech Festival. So um, good luck to the team there. Um, but yeah, we, we, that's the kind of first step we see. Help people in constructing the, the regulatory reports, uh, allow them to do things consistently and generate the, the, the regulatory data as required by the regulations. Uh, do it in terms of, of standards which are used for the day-to-day -day for how things are stored in real risk systems and settlement systems. And then uh, that, that's the first step and we can move then to a, to a pull architecture, uh, which, which I think you know, um, uh, we can discuss in a moment, but that's the first step to move to that pull architecture to allow regulators see the granular data uh, if they understand the, the data model that's used by the market day to day, then um, and we can generate what they need using it, then the next step is obviously to, to allow them to have further access uh, via new technologies in to see what the, what's, what's in the, inside the machine, so to speak. Well, that is a fantastic segue in. Thank you to Machie to talk a little bit about the uh, the architecture. Of course, I think there was a very there was a very interesting uh, FSB report recently um, that I think showed a statistic quite a, quite an alarming one actually um, that uh, regulatory authorities were still largely using Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> now um, it's probably quite embarrassing to, to some extent, but um, Machie, can you um, talk uh, talk to us perhaps? about um, one of the most prominent use cases at the moment um, that, that many of us turn to, and that is um, ORREP in Austria, and Bearing Point, of course, um, had quite some role to play um, in that use case. Sure, Joe, thank you. And indeed, we had a great privilege in starting, I think, in the year 2013, to get involved in the ORREP project. Uh, and uh, the ORREP project is about providing a countrywide infrastructure. We're talking about the uh, kind of data factory for over 850 banking institutions to provide data to the central bank and to the supervisor authority. And de facto, it's a kind of pool approach because we have a standardized data model on the input side. So what Ian was, uh, was talking about on the transactions, we are doing this for the credit business and derivatives and other products. And this is being kind of pulled by the, the regulator to fulfill their needs. And this provided for a great flexibility for the Austrian central bank, and what you are alluding to, that you know this is often in the in the crunch scenario what regulators are missing. So if you have a predefined templates, regardless of its Excel or some electronic media for templates, you are still not having the flexibility. Or, in other words, the flexibility is predefined in the template. When you switch to data like we did in Austria, uh, regulators are getting great flexibility to ask what actually they want. Uh, in the infrastructure part, we actually advanced the thinking from Austria in the, in the also recent mentioned already the, the BIS uh, tech sprint, where we used actually our latest cloud native technology to see, can we actually enable regulators to way more flexibly pull this granular data via APIs? And this is possible. You have technologies today that are allowing that, and I believe that will be the future 
set up also in the infrastructure side. So some lessons learned both from Austria, but also from the from the recent tech spring. And uh, we, we kind of started to call this approach RegOps. Uh, we, we simply believe that, you know, with RegOps, uh, it's uh, what DevOps was for software development. RegOps should introduce agility and speed for regulatory development. So that's uh, something behind the concept there. Thank you, Maciej. I think this is actually a nice time to turn now to the sort of second half of our session, which is on the analytics, um, and in particular the area of um, big data analytics. And I think in making transformations to data and how it's stored and, and processed, et cetera, there's also um, considerable opportunity to complement these changes by applying um, new analytical tools, particularly in relation to, to unstructured and, and big data sets. It's perhaps fair to say that financial services have been slightly comparatively later in their embrace and adoption of more uh, advanced analytical tools. Um, here I'm talking about machine learning and natural language processing, et cetera, which do have enormous potential to, to generate new insights on the financial system. Um, but I think regulators too are really still grappling with how they can embrace this new technology as part of their uh, supervisory toolkit. So, Kenneth, maybe I'll, I'll direct this to you, but um, how can supervisors take that next step and leverage the, the potential power of, of these new um, tools, big data analytics, et cetera, with these improvements to, to data collection um, and reporting? And, and how can authorities not just sort of adopt uh, this technology, but also socialise these new tools uh, for, for successful uh, supervisory use. Thanks, Joy. That's a that's a great question and something that uh, we are still, uh, you know, in a way, uh, uh, try to to push hard at the authority. Uh, we we have made some um, early progress, which I'm quite uh, happy to share on. Uh, so, to your question as to how uh, you know we can integrate uh, different types of uh, data. Again, you know, going back to the to, to to what the point I made earlier, one should always start with the use case in mind. So, for example, I think uh, you know you mentioned COVID, and I think that presents very rich opportunities uh, in terms of uh, different types of risks that supervisors would be interested in. You know, for example, they, they could be interested in um, you know uh, so-called risks evolving at the granular level of the portfolios that are undergoing moratoria. Uh, they could also, for example, be interested in so-called more broader macro evolutions. You know, in terms of the uh, asset markets that they are uh, looking at, which could be, for example, uh, real estate, for example, which is quite a large asset class and which has been quite uh, impacted by the COVID pandemic as, uh, as a result of uh, many uh, mortgage moratoria that have been granted. So linking that to then big data, big data, of course, you know, uh, you know, we all know has, uh, you know, high volume, you know, which enables us to provide greater confidence in the inferences from the data. So in this case, uh, one of the useful data sets that we have found uh, is to, for example, be able to make better use of news because news is something that is quite high frequency. Uh, this is a type of uh, unstructured data and it provides quite a lot of rich signals, I would say, in terms of picking up, you know, uh, shifts, uh, you know, not only within our own um, jurisdiction, but also, you know, what we have found in, in Singapore is that there is a large degree of commonality uh, in the challenges that we face, that supervisors face in addressing COVID and the sort of steps that we need to take. So being able to use big data systematically, for example, to even start with the with the basics, and you had asked that question, you know, how do supervisors start? What I'll always say is that you'll hear a lot, you know, about, uh, you know, fancy uh, so-called techniques and so on in, in answering that. Those are always great, but we should always start from somewhere, you know, take take, take smaller steps, take the, get the simple things right first, get your data sources right. I think that, that would be my first uh, recommendation. So if you want to use news, find a news data source. If you need, you know, other data that you uh, need to collect from your financial institutions, then have that, you know, done properly, you know. So if you do both together, you can form in a way a kind of pincer approach that I like to think about it because you, you start with the use case on one hand, but at the same time, you're also thinking about how you set up the relevant types that you then need to, you know, set up in order to bring them together and have it flow and the flow is a very important concept in 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 the, in the in in a way that the value chain because that's where the value is delivered to supervisors. We want a state where you know the supervisor is able to you know come to work every day to be able to you know look at their 
you know, computers and have in front of them, you know, a very useful so-called dashboard or, you know, um, a kind of point of view that's really there. All the, you know, information that they need, you know, is there in front of them. All the risks that may be there are presented to them, you know, which could be, you know, machine learning or other types of techniques, you know, so that it really saves the time that, you know, uh, they would otherwise have spent trying to pull all these to get, uh, data together, uh, you know, uh, in a manual fashion and increases the amount of time that they then have to consider the risk. So uh, I would say, you know, of course, there, there are many, uh, you know, uh, techniques that can be applied, like what I mentioned, but uh, uh, for, for many supervisors, just even starting, uh, I would say, from those basics is, is helpful, but of course, happy to share a bit more on other techniques as well. Thanks. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, that sort of got me thinking, um, much here you were talking about um, uh, RegOps. Could you talk to us a little bit about how um, something like RegOps could also leverage um, big data, for instance? Is that is that something that that RegOps could could do as well? Definitely. Uh, we are talking about the very granular data on the contract or, as, as, as already Ian explained, transaction level. So that's a, the prerequisite for regulators to have the clean definition of, let's say, atomic uh, records so that they can use this modern, fantastic technology zone. So when you are on the templates, that's a bit difficult. Once you start working with the data that RegOps provides, it's becoming possible. So RegOps is more the enabler to get the, and of course, this is based on the big data technology. You need to scale this technology flexibly without huge costs that uh, in the traditional or older technologies this will be incurring. So, so from this perspective, it is, it is of course big data based. What I like very interesting, once you have this in place, uh, Kenneth, you kind of uh, put this as a vision there. And I recently had a conversation with vice governor of National Bank of Croatia with Martina. Martina has this vision of minority report. So the supervisor is the pre-crime unit. If you remember this movie with Tom Cruise, the supervisor comes in, knows where the risks are happening before they actually happen. But you know, this is a kind of long, long-term vision. But there's certain elements, and and you are absolutely right. You know, the data and the big data analytics is, is one component of this. And we believe that that RegOps can be a very strong enabler as a backbone to achieve such visions for supervisors to work way more efficiently, and at the same time, not to burden the financial institutions. That's I think another charm of RegOps to avoid the constant change pain to the banks and insurers. Thank you, Mache. And that, again, is a wonderful segue to the, the, the last part of our discussion, which I wanted to turn to. I mean, with all these valuable insights, use cases that are, that are out there right now, I just wanted to have a brief discussion on how can we get regulators and banks motivated to, to make these changes? We talked about um, data standardization, we talked about the architecture and even um, starting to bring in um, big data analysis as well. Um, how, how can we get them motivated? But on the flip side, what do you also see as the main hurdles for more widespread uh, adoption? Um, maybe Ian, I can ask you to, to start this off. Sure. So, um... So a few big statements to start with. Uh, it's not a technology problem. Um, it's a people problem. Um, culture needs to shift. Uh, on both sides, I think, you know, um, regulators um, can probably step back a little bit and not be so specific in their requirements and be more uh, general, uh, say, you know, we want uh, information about this part of the market and then kind of work uh, uh, iteratively with the market to, to build solutions uh, using open standards like the CDM. I have to, 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 to plug it. Um, but definitely definitely shift that culture so that we're all working together. We're both, you know, uh, both sides of the market are, are, are trying to do the same thing. Um, and certainly the financial institutions want to mutualize these things, want to use open source models. Um, and then I think, you know, so the regulators need to do that. They're doing a great Great job of that. The Innovation Hub is a great example. There's a, lots of other examples globally. Um, and, you know, the, the work that, that Kenneth and MAS do exa is, is exactly uh, the, the right thing to be doing. Um, and then the, the financial institutions need to, um, be, to, to be not so frightened, I think, of, of the regulatory community. We need to shift that culture and not see it as the, the scary regulators that you only get someone to when something's wrong. We need to work together to kind of provide a data 
uh, ecosystem for the future that that can allow all these these you know big data analytics to be applied and build that. I, I love the, the the minority report example. Um, uh, kudos to, to Martina in, in Zagreb. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely, uh, uh, that's the future. I think it's a people problem. It's not a technology problem. So. Um Kenneth, we have a people problem. <laughs> what are we going to do? How do we get regulators more motivated to, to, to make these changes? We do often hear that, um, uh, you know, there needs to be a, a cultural shift towards embracing perhaps uh, not just technology, of course, but uh, the processes perhaps to make the technology adoption easier. Um, the MAS, of course, is a, a leader in this in this space. Can you tell us how um, the MAS has done this, and perhaps any advice that uh, that you can share with uh, with the audience who perhaps may also be part of the regulatory community? Sure. Uh, so. Of course, I really must say that uh, the MES, along with other regulators, is still on quite an early stage of this journey. But again, some some learnings that uh, we've had so far uh, to your question, Joy. First, I, I think of, of, of this uh, issue, I have three, in a way, principles in mind. First, I think it helps to begin with the end uh, in mind. You know, this really helps in terms of, you know, trying to even, you know, getting from, you know, starting at, at ground zero and how to move forward from there. Having a bit of uh, clarity in terms of the uh, end goals or at least the benefits that this uh, transformation can bring about really helps in terms of at least getting the uh, you know uh, the, the the excitement there or you know getting you know people at least interested in wanting to start on this transformation journey so that definitely helps a lot having clear use cases uh, and, and how the value is to be delivered is, is very important and I think uh, second uh, part of that is that you, we should also think about you know how do we measure some of these goals that we want to, uh, you know, achieve? Because what you mentioned is, uh, you know, the, the, you know, staffing in a way or the skill sets, you know, that in, in, in a way shorter supply when it comes to tech uh, in, reg, uh, in, in, in amongst regulators. So we should also think about how do we measure this, you know, data maturity or skill sets and how do we have plans in order to uplift them over time? That's something that's also quite important to have in mind and to be able to track along the way as well. Uh, very importantly as well, I would say don't boil the ocean, you know, when we do it, because a lot of times one way that uh, we can get uh, fatigued very quickly, you know, is to say, oh, you know, I'm just going to transform everything at one go. But uh, that's when a lot of things, you know, don't end up uh, working the way that you want to. And it's even much harder to deliver value. So always start scope the project small, uh, you know, uh, and that also applies, by the way, for, 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 for regulatory reporting as well. You know, we shouldn't look to try to roll out something to the entire industry you know, for example, ideally, you know, in, in, in one go, but try to really find ways to iterate it, validate the hypotheses that we have. Yeah, so I'll just quickly add two more points. I'm mindful of the time, but uh, as, as to how we can, you know, solve these uh, challenges. Second thing I would say, you know, is, is definitely use the right tools for the job. I think um, Achich and the rest had already brought the, up the concept of, uh, uh, you know, what, what is called RegOps. And I think, you know, even thinking about DevOps as well, what I would quickly say to that is, uh, to regulators is, the success of tech firms uh, is underpinned by their rapid ability to iterate their products quickly in order to better meet customers' needs. And the reason why they do that are the tools, a key part of it is the tools and practices that they have, you know, using open source software, DevOps, uh, containerization in order to quickly scale. These are already tried and tested. And of course, I would say, you know, as and when you can find a way to get started on that journey, you know, that that, that is quite helpful as well, which is something that we've also done at the authority. Finally, last point, of course, I would say in doing this, uh, in any difficult task, it always takes a village. Find the right partners who, you know, would be, you know, happy to work with you and update each other. So once again, you know, the BI's Innovation Hub is a great place for that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kenneth. I think we have about a minute, but Machia, I wanted to um, quickly finally get onto this, uh, onto the point that there are, you know, many, many um, uh, vendors out there, lots of solutions. What advice do you have for, for regulatory authorities who, who want to seek a solution but don't know where to start? Well, in fact, particularly interesting, and this started a few years ago, is you know, this innovation type of procurement. And I like a lot the, the, the tech sprint, the hackathons. We had a great pleasure to work with the FCA in 2016. Tech sprint now with BIS. There is a lot of ways to first innovate, but you could actually apply this also to procurement. And we are very privileged to take part right now with one large regulator in a kind of rapid procurement process. 
which combines the prototyping with formal procurement, which is quite unusual because public authorities are very formal. So I believe that's a really interesting way of testing the solutions before you formally embark on a large procurement journey and spend large budgets on them. So very interesting approach. And I would believe that this could open eyes for, for some of more innovative solutions, maybe which are a bit hidden from this large formal procurements these days. Thank you so much, Machie, Kenneth and um, Ian. I wish we had more time. Thank you so much for all your insights and the discussion and have a very good day and evening and morning to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What a great panel. Our sincere thanks to Dr. Joy Wan and the panel of speakers there.